five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to School Days, help for moms and dads of school-aged kids. I'm Danita Bailey. And I'm David Bailey. Thank you so much for joining our show today. Today's show is about advocating for your child at school if they need some sort of accommodations or services. And this is a subject that really hits close to home for us. Uh, David and I have two sons, and they were recently diagnosed with issues that require that they receive services and accommodations at school. Uh, one of our sons, our eight-year-old, has autism, and the other one has anxiety, our 10-year-old. And last year, we were on a journey to get them properly diagnosed and to get them what they needed in the classroom. And we're so thankful that we had friends and other professionals in fields that were relative that could help us navigate and get the advice that we needed. Um, but we know that that's not the truth for so many. So many parents don't even know what to do. So when I was in the classroom, what I began to notice was, well, first of all, at the beginning of the school year, I always uh, had a list of students who had accommodations that, knew, that uh, I had to be aware of. There were this basically say, hey, look, these students need special uh, accommodations in the classroom. And so I always got that list, but there's always a group of kids who every year I never got accommodations for. And I was like, hmm. Something's going on here, but I didn't quite know what it was. I couldn't quite put my thumb on it. Uh, and sometimes I'd call the parent and, you know, just kind of see what's going on and, you know, not, not saying anything directly. And then they would say, hey, uh, oh, yeah, by the way, they're on medication for this. Or, hey, they have this. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and so um, what we're going to do today is we're going to dig deeper into finding out um, you know, what do you do if you think your child is having some challenges uh, that, need, that may need to be further explored? We're also going to take a look at some of the terminology um, that goes with students uh, that have special needs. And then uh, if a school comes back with a decision, what do you do if you don't agree with the decision that they come down with? And how do you respond to that? We have many other issues we're going to talk today um, about as well. Uh, but we are so excited to uh, share today. So before we go any further, let me just say it takes a village. If you hear a great parenting tip or a nugget of advice, we want you to share it with your parent friends that will see your feed. Facebook it, Instagram it, tweet it, link it in, and add the hashtag, hashtag school dazed show or school dazed or I am school dazed. And also, we want you to be a part of the show. If you have any questions or comments, give us a call at 214 431 five zero six two so you can comment or uh, share your experiences so let's jump right in today on the show we have Rondi Allen and Rondi Allen is a board certified behavioral therapist she has worked as a behavioral therapist a parent coach special needs advocate for 18 years Rondi served as autism specialist for a major school district and made the decision to practice privately in order to give more personalized attention to her clients she also spent several years as Director of Special Needs and Disabilities Mis uh, Ministries at Bentry Bible Fellowship, where she established one of the first ministries for special needs families in the DFW Metroplex. Uh, she is also a wife and mother of three children, one of whom receives special services uh, for special needs. So welcome, Morandi. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Good morning. Good morning. All right, and I am so honored to welcome Suzanne Scott. Uh, Suzanne was born and raised in Barbados and migrated to New York City after high school. I caught that accent there a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> um, she worked in human resources and payroll uh, for ABC TV for almost 20 years. And when her two-year-old daughter was diagnosed with autism, she made a decision to follow her longtime desire to pursue a career in education. Um, Suzanne's desire to get an understanding of her own child's special needs caused her to go back to school and earn a master's degree in special education from Grand Canyon University. She has been a special education teacher in the Arlington Independent School District for over five years and recently assumed the department chair position. Uh, Su Suzanne's passion has become one of advocacy for students with disabilities and teaching them and their parents to self-advocate in the school and in the community. 
Welcome, Suzanne. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Well, let's get started because th this is a broad topic that has, you know, so many mm -hmm. different, we could talk about this for several shows, so mm -hmm. we want to go ahead and jump right in. So I know you can't be specific because there's a number of disabilities and special factors that qualify under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, but what are some general observations that parents should be looking for to see if they're child has any potential needs? Well, um, I would comment on that because as a behavioral therapist, I work um, mostly, I'm working for the parents and alongside the parents instead of in the school. So I would say that it's very important to start looking for signs of any time of type of disability. Um, once your child is even 12 to 18 months old, between that and two years old, um, especially autism, um, autistic spectrum, spectrum disorder does come along and start to um, show symptoms. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer for um, those symptoms to look different from any typically developing or what we would call neurotypical child. Um, it would also be very important once they get into school to see if they're hitting their developmental milestones um, and are behaving in a way that's typical of other kiddos their age. Mm -hmm. um, really and truly, the responsibility, I feel, falls to the parent to be looking for things like lack of eye contact, um, flapping, spinning, um, repetitive, uh, re repetitive phrases um, that a child might or have and say, or possibly even um, a, an interest in a certain topic that is very, very specific and very strong. Um, those are some things to look for just in general for um, autism spectrum disorder because we see the most of that. Um, one in every four children born today um, is a child on the autism spectrum. Um, but in general, we also want to look at the functioning of the child in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Are they functioning as other children are functioning? Because when the school district sees or the parent sees that they are not functioning as per typical in the classroom, then it means that there is time. It is time to start looking at accommodations. Right. And um, just from our standpoint, our 10 year old was doing great in school. He was getting all A's and B's and he was on the honor roll every six, every six weeks. And then when he hit fourth grade, was it yeah, fourth, grade. fourth grade, his grades started to really suffer. And we were kind of wondering what was going on. He was saying that he was being bullied. And that just started our, us on an exploration to try to figure out what was going on. And it turned out he ended up with uh, anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. But the key was, okay, this kid is an AB student. And now he's not performing like he had been. Yes. So that was our first kind of red flag that we needed to look deeper into what was going on. There are so many different needs that children can have, diagnoses that they can have that will allow them and to have services from the school district or present a need for that. Um, what you're speaking of with your child and what I've experienced with my own also is anxiety, um, OCD, ADHD. Those things do qualify a child for special services. Right. Um, but then we do have the opposite end where we have some things that are more severe like autism spectrum disorder, mm -hmm. cerebral palsy, um, some things that we see that are actually physically manifested. Right. So um, yes, it does cover behavioral issues. It covers emotional issues. It covers mental issues. Right. So what, what do you do when you suspect that there's something wrong? What would be your first recommendation to do? Well, if you don't already have, uh, you know, uh, being in contact with your child's pediatrician mm -hmm. and you know those milestones are not being met um, that would be the first place you know with the milestones but uh, once they're they've started school and you notice uh, usually you know parents have that instinct mm -hmm. that something is just not right 
um, I say communication with the teacher would be, um, you know, th that's foremost because sometimes a parent is not seeing something at home, but the child may be doing that thing at school mm -hmm. and it, it, you know, because some things are just not transferred. Right. Um, so it may or may not be okay, you know, um, because that child is doing that thing at school. It, they are saying words, they are, you know, their, their speech is developing. Um, but sometimes at home, they're so catered to that they don't feel the need to perform or do the things that, um, um, we expect them to do uh, and, and, and children grow and mature at different rates. So, you know, sometimes it's okay that they're a little delayed, mm -hmm. but communication with the school and with the teacher is up, is very important. Um, however, when they're, you know, once you've communicated and, and all the parties are seeing there's something wrong, then you contact, you know, the, um, administration or you know the special education department and request um, evaluation and once a, an evaluation is requested and um, it should be in writing either in the form of you know a letter or email because if it's not written it's not said um, um, then the school has a certain amount of time to get that evaluation done and I think, too, there's a huge difference in what to do if you suspect something's going on with your child, depending upon their age, depending upon what that may be. Mm -hmm. So if you have a child that is under preschool age and mm -hmm. you're starting to think that something may be off, um, ECI, Early Childhood Intervention, right. is a great resource for parents to reach out to to receive services. Um, it, it can be for something as simple as a speech delay. Mm -hmm. um, and they will come out to your house and do an evaluation. That being said, I feel like as a professional who has worked very closely with many families, I feel it's very important to point out that um, there have been many families who think that that one call to the school district or that one call to ECI will give them a full diagnosis and that's just not correct. It's just not. Um, there are a number of things that a parent would need to, uh, to do. Yes, the school district is absolutely a resource, absolutely a resource, but um, I want to give a couple of other resources here. Um, personally, I favor, um, personally, I favor um, having a multidisciplinary diagnosis done, which means that um, professionals of all different fields, behavioral therapists, speech therapists, occupational therapists, psychiatrists, all come together and um, for the purpose of doing a diagnosis on a child. Um, you can get this type of diagnosis done at Cook Children's Behavioral. Mm -hmm. You can also get it done at our Children's House, um, which is a branch of Children's Medical out of Dallas, but they have locations all over the Metroplex. Okay. Um, those are some great, great places resources. to start. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a great thought. Um, we do have a caller here. Caller, can you tell us your name? Hi, this is Tyowa. How are you? Hi, Tyowa. Well, we're great. Tyowa, where, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Austin, Texas. Excellent. What's All your right. question? I don't have a question yet. I just called in so I could hear you. I'm in my vehicle driving. I just dialed in. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, you can actually catch us on fbrn.us, and we're in the blue stream. This, this phone number All is right. for, uh, for calling questions and comments. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll note for the future. Okay, great. Thanks right. so much for calling. Thanks, Tarawa. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So, uh, Rondi, you mentioned ECI, and I'm so yes. thankful that you did that. Mm -hmm. We actually used ECI with um, Jonathan, who had speech delay, mm -hmm. and he did not start 
even repeating after us until he was two. And yeah. so we suspected that there was an issue and somebody, probably you, because I've known <laughs> you for a while, <laughs> yeah. told me about ECI. And ECI mm -hmm. is a free service. It's um, early childhood intervention. I'm sorry, did you say free? It is free. It is free. free. It's yeah. a free, free service. And what they I do like is free. they have a therapist come to your home and work with your child. Yeah. Uh, the catch, though, is that you need to catch any developmental delays before they're three. Yes. Because they do age out of the program when they're three. But the good thing is, is that at that point, then when they're three, they can be tested by the school district for walk in services, mm -hmm. which is what we did. And um, we qualified for those services. And he received speech therapy at the school around the corner yeah. uh, 30 minutes a week. Yes. Or and you can also PPCD program, um, uh, which would be um, a preschool program um, at one of the public schools nearest to you right. that is for kiddos who have some type of a special need. Um, so yeah, our state provides free preschool for children who have a need. Right. Um, and you know, I want to also talk um, just shortly, I want to mention another resource out there for parents that believe there might be something wrong with their kiddo. Um, we have Dan Doctors Now, D-A-N. It stands for Defeat Autism Now. Mm. And there are certain doctors that are, they affiliate as Dan Doctors, which means that they, most of the time, they have a passion for this, mm. um, for working with kiddos on the spectrum. And as a result, um, they specialize a little bit more tightly in that area. There are so many things that, that um, can be done um, for kiddos with autism. And so reaching out to a Dan Doctor um, is also a great place to start to see. But, you know, I want to say something uh, you were you were mentioning about your kiddo and and I know for mine too as a mother there is so much to be said about mother's intuition absolutely yes. Yeah. Yes. yes when you know something is is not exactly right with your child you know yes. and um I, I remember when my child was two, he was not speaking and our pediatrician actually dismissed it and said, you mm -hmm. know what? Boys talk later than girls, Rondi. Right. <laughs> you need to understand that your expectations might be a little too high. And I pursued it because I felt as a mother that there was something off. And lo and behold, we found a hearing deficit. Mm -hmm. So... um if you're a mom or dad out there right now listening and you feel like there is something going on, be your child's advocate. Yeah, absolutely. Because you do know. Yeah. You do know in your heart of hearts. Yeah, and that actually happened with Jonathan, our eight-year-old. I've thought for probably four years that he had autism. And, you know, I spoke to his pediatrician every time we'd have a well kid. And nobody, you know, I spoke to all sorts of people, that teachers you know, they would say that, you know, in kindergarten, I think he he started having some behavioral problems. And I said, you know, is this a time when we would test him to see if there's any issues? And she's like, no, I've seen that <laughs> go away in first and second grade. Mm -hmm. And so finally, in, in, when he was eight, what you said earlier happened, Rondi, is the things that we were seeing in him were things that could possibly go away with age. Would be age appropriate for they a four-year-old, but not exactly. an eight-year-old. Exactly. Now yes. that they've persisted, mm -hmm. they finally you know, were able to diagnose him with autism. Yes. I want to um, speak to the Dan doctors. Now, um, I, as a parent, uh, spent thousands of dollars on the Dan doctors. And sometimes I feel like Dan doctors <laughs> give parents of kids with autism false hope that this pill or this, um, not pill, because they don't believe in pills, but this natural type remedy is going to make the autism go away. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I just want to caution parents to that it's, there is no miracle answer to autism. Right. And um, it's, you know, we can do as much as we can to help our kids live a uh, good life uh you know quality a good quality of life um but what happens is parents end up spending a lot of money on on these remedies and um and sometimes it, it may or may not help right i think it's important to point out actually so if we're going to be completely scientifically correct 
There is only one thing that is proven scientifically to improve um, a child's functioning if the child is on the spectrum um, of autism, um, and that would be behavioral therapy. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is it. Yes. Everything mm -hmm. else is something that you can try. be tried. Mm -hmm. You can possibly get benefits from. You might not get benefits from. I've seen some clients who made huge improvements by taking gluten and casein out of their diet, but I've also had clients who didn't have anything different happen right. for mm -hmm. that. So, And, and for that mm -hmm. matter, even medication, um, you know, I tried um, – medication for uh, my daughter and it caused weight gain mm -hmm. it helped with the behavior but right. it caused tremendous weight gain and um and you know you don't know that it did help because there were still behaviors um however you know it, it is a trial and error mm -hmm. and you do the best there is no script on what you do you know to yeah. make this go away um, but we do our best and we um, we go with instinct we work with our doctors we work with educators and um, you know we give our children the best quality of life and also just in our journey of getting help for our children we've realized that there are limited resources when it comes to working for chil working with children in mm -hmm. the um, areas of mental wellness and things like that. And so they're still kind of, I think, trying to figure out yes. what it is, you know, as far as medicating the child and figuring out what the, the formula is. They, they do better with adults, I think. And with children, we're yeah. just tr still trying to figure stuff yes. out. So you just got to be patient and vocal with your doctor, uh, your psychi psychiatrist, yes. And if there's continuing to be issues, let them know so that they can make some changes. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So I, I had, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier in the show, um, you know, as a teacher, saying, hey, your child has X, Y, Z. Um, that's a red flag because mm -hmm. we're not trained. Teachers not trained to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have our suspicions and intuitions uh, about what may be going on. Um, and so what should a parent be listening for from a teacher to even know, you know, not necessarily a particular symptom, but like what type of stuff should they be hearing for? I know like for me, I, I, I would say, for example, I would say uh, this is something that I, I've observed these things in your child. I, yes. You know, I observed A, B, and C. I'm just being, I'm just stating the facts, not giving reasons or causes why, but just saying, I noticed this, I noticed this. They have a hard time staying in their seat, you know, focus. They're like, crawling under tables. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had that comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and so, you know, as teachers, uh, what they should be doing is just saying, you know, the observations and concerns. Uh, but then from there, uh, you know, the parent has to take that in Absolutely. and process. Yes. You know, I think another thing is, you know, kind of is, am I seeing parallel behavior or, or actions or, you know, with whatever it is that teachers bring up, do I see the parallel actions happening here? Can you guys elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, like you said, it, you know, sometimes if the, if the chair, the, the family is in other environments like church and, um, the daycare, uh, you know, after school programs. Mm -hmm. And, um, if, if everybody is saying, you know, I'm seeing these inappropriate behaviors, then the parent needs to reach out and get some type of evaluation, um, find out what is causing these behaviors. Um, however, um, uh, you know, um, the, the parent needs to... Um, act on on the information they're getting because we can go into denial as a parent sometimes right. and because yes. we don't know mm -hmm. where to go mm -hmm. um but and we don't want there to be something wrong with our child yes. you know <laughs> but we can yes. reach out to a family member who may be um more um apt to get 
you know, to do research. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot on the Internet, there is, um, which we need to be careful with. But, but there is places, you know, we can start doing some research. Research. I know for me, sometimes it became overwhelming, but um, I reached out and, you know, you get the help that you need. And um, there are so many, there's so many groups on Facebook yes. and you mentioned church. There's groups at church. When Jonathan received the autism diagnosis, I started looking at those groups and joining those groups just to find out what yes. other mothers are doing. I spoke to other moms at church who I knew had um, autism and and just to find out what it was that you did because we had those meetings at yes. school coming up and mm -hmm. I was terrified that we weren't going to get what they needed and I needed their tips what what did you do what did what did what kind of information did you come to the meeting with and what do I need to do well and so, I think that that bridges us uh, to uh, another really great question when we go to the school district and we request testing to be done of our child or possibly we've done it privately and we come to the school with our testing that we've done privately what do we do if what their suggestions uh, that they bring to us of services and accommodations are, are something that we disagree with. <laughs> right, and one <laughs> of the parent. things that they're gonna start with is an RTI. Yes. That was what was mentioned to us, and so mm -hmm. can you talk that to what the that step is? one. So RTI is actually response to intervention, and this does not put a child into um, the classification of special needs. It does not put them into special education. All an RTI is, is a teacher has seen some behaviors in the classroom that they feel like some type of intervention would be beneficial for and at the level of an RTI it is a very informal meeting with the parent the school counselor um, the teacher and usually an administrator and it's just you know here is what we see your child do all right let's try and do this in response to it um, and and it's important to note that this is not legally binding such as what what would be in an ARD um, that would come later if right. the need presented itself but so an RTI is something also that can go away from year to year um, my own son uh, had an RTI one year uh, requested by a teacher and the next year the teacher said we have no need for this RTI mm -hmm. so we did not continue with the response to intervention based on so it's very much based on what the teacher is seeing in the classroom and this can be for even a child with no diagnosis right it can be for a child that tends to be a little hyper that tends to react a certain way in different circumstances so it's a very base level intervention that the school can put into place and so Suzanne for example, ADHD, what are some of the RTI steps that you would take in the classroom to help that child? Um, so there are accommodations that all teachers should be using um, that's going to help every kid in the classroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, as if, if we see a, a child, you know, being very active, um, just uh, sit in the child either depending on the child, close to the teacher, mm -hmm. or at the back of the classroom. You know, the whole goal is to so that that child would gain, you know, as much from the academic atmosphere as possible, as well as the other kids in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, uh, preferential seating, um, organizational help because some mm -hmm. kids are like totally you know they lose everything uh, just you know the teacher um, having specific places in the classroom for everything um, just you know some kids they thrive on order you know right um, um, Different types of seating is that part of RTI? Would that yes, be part of yes. the? It like, can be uh, anything. It can be part of the ITI RTI. Excuse me. It can also be part of a 504 plan or mm -hmm. even part of uh, the decisions made in an ARD. Right. Um, but one important thing to note is that a 504 plan does not affect the academic goals of an individual child. Right. And let's let's get into that. Yeah, so you know, so you know, there's this jargon that's kind of right. floats around. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear them all the time, and and uh, but just for, for parents, 
uh, you know, what is a 504? What is an ARD? Uh, I like what what are the, what do these what do these mean? And, IEP, you know, yeah, IEP, IEP. and I, how, yes. And so, how, how does that? What are the implications for parents, and what should they know about those? So, when a child has a, a, a acceptable diagnosis, um, uh, and what does that mean? Acceptable a diagnosis, a disability. So, idea, um, which is um, governs the whole special education program in the whole United States. Um, has specific disabilities that come under, that qualify a child for um, special education. Yes, right. and, and, and specifically the school is looking to give accommodations to children that are, um, their functioning in the classroom is affected by the diagnosis. Right. So it could be possible that a child would have a diagnosis that does not, it, it was determined to not have any bearing on their functioning in the classroom, and the school would say, we're not going to give services for that because the school's goal is in school, not at home, right? not in life after school. Right. Their goal is for school only. Absolutely. Very mm -hmm. good point. So what, what, tell us what the differences are, because I know that that was a very confusing thing for me, all these terms, 504, when do I have 504, when do mm -hmm. I have an ARD? What's an IEP? So the RTI we covered, mm -hmm. um, the next step would be a 504 plan. And that would be a, uh, a plan that is put together um, under the same, uh, the same laws that, um, are, that govern the ARD, except for these are just accommodations in the classroom. This does not put a child into a special ed program, meaning their academic goals are the same academic goals as every other child. So my, my own son has a 504 plan. Um, and he, an example of, of, what is on his plan is that um, he is allowed to take tests by himself. Um, it makes him very anxious when he sees other people finishing fast and turning their work in. So he can take a test in a room by himself and that makes him more successful. Um, preferential seating can be an idea. Using a squeezy ball during the day um, in order to, um, you know, sit, have some type of sensory input, just depending upon that specific diagnosis, those would be examples of what a 504 plan would be. So a 504 yeah. is just accommodation. Yes. It doesn't change the academic plan as the other typically developing students is just accommodations. Yes. So by by ch by saying change the academic plan, what does that mean? They're going to be learning all the same things that the other students yes. are learning. Yes. The requirements in order to make a grade, mm -hmm. whatever say a fifth grader is learning in math. Right. Um the child with the 504 plan is learning the exact same thing. Okay. He might have an accommodation he or she may have an accommodation that allows them to go about learning differently. However, they have the same, they're being graded on the same thing. Right. Whereas once you bridge into an IEP, which stands for Individualized Education Plan, which is put together through a meeting called an ARD, um, at that point, you have the flexibility based on the disability for um, parents and educators to change the educational goals for that specific child um, and put it at a range that would be acceptable for their specific disability. Mm -hmm. And so what they would be graded upon every grading term would be that that is right. set in the ARD meeting. And right. it can go from a very high functioning child who has very little changed all the way to uh, an individual who is older and has, has bridged into more vocational training or even self-care goals um, versus multiplication and division and algebra, things like that. Do you need to have a diagnosis to get a 504 or can it just be 
there's some issues in the classroom and we need to put some accommodations in plan in place. You must have a diagnosis and that diagnosis must impact the child's functioning in the classroom. Okay. And when then do we switch over to getting an IEP and having an ARD instead of a 504? Well, uh, when when that disability affects the functioning of the child in the classroom, then they they be uh, they have a special education plan. Okay. Because that plan, as Rondi said, is individualized, um, and you know even though uh, and it's 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 wide, uh, you know because it can be a child who is um, just life skills who is non -fun non verbal not you know mm -hmm. um not able to uh learn any academics uh, maybe just the basics to a child who um is able to uh participate in the general education classroom but they need um maybe some type of in class support like mm -hmm. a, a teacher going in and checking on them for 30 minutes a day and making sure that they're um uh uh accessing the the curriculum um you know as the other students are so it it it's a wide range of services that special education provides. Mm -hmm. It can be a learning disability all the way through like dyslexia. Yes, all the way through something that would uh, impact the child's ability to ever be an independent adult. And, and they're not just learning disabilities like uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, uh, or mental issues like... Um, I can't think of one right now. Anxiety. <laughs> anxiety. Depression. Thank you. Think anxiety <laughs> depression. But also obesity, <sighs> I, re I found out, is um, something that can allow for accommodations in the classroom. Oh, goodness gracious. Special seating. this is special, new to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> special. Yeah, there are a lot of them, yeah. Yeah, special seating is necessary. Sometimes access to elevators is necessary yeah. for obesity, tuberculosis, different accidents yeah. that you may have gotten into. Brain injuries. Brain injuries. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a wide array of things that qualify for services in the classroom. And we actually have on our website on schooldaysshow.com a list of sample accommodations and modifications that you can look at as parents and come to your meeting with uh, so that you are armed with some tools and some things that you can recommend to the administration and to the mm -hmm. teachers. Because at least I noticed in our ARD, they came to the table with two or three things that they recommended for my child and I had about 10 mm -hmm. right. because I had a friend who told <laughs> me some things that I could also recommend and they ended up putting all of those things in the IEP yes. right. and several of them have caused him to have great success. So I'm thankful awesome. that we didn't just go with what the teachers and the administrators Absolutely. suggested because wh why do you want to go in there with a plan? And uh, Suzanne, I, can you I, mention I, that? I 100% agree with parents doing their research on knowing their child. You know that child from the day of birth. You've, you've mm -hmm. seen every change, every um, milestone they've met, and every milestone they've not met. So you are the expert on your child. So I advocate for knowing, uh, researching what the needs of your child and what the school district or the law says that these are the things that would help your child. You come to that meeting with those things um, and present them to the IEP team. Now, the team, uh, you know, for parents who are new to this, is made up of a special education teacher, a general education teacher, um, an administrator, um, any type of specialist, if there is, if the child has uh, speech or language issues or uh, behavioral issues, they um, might be a behavioral specialist um, and a diagnostician. And um, it's the team of of professionals, along with the parent and the child, if possible, um, that make the decisions. But the parent is a very crucial part of the team. Yes. And the parent has, the law says that the parent has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Now the parent, you know, you can't bring this and say my child needs this and this is what the, the district has to do. 
Be, but the team considers what you bring to the table. But I advise every parent, bring something to the table. Absolutely. Because you're the yes. expert on your child. Well, and I will add also, in my professional role, what I do a lot is, uh, because I am working with the family, um, I go to the ARDS and, and represent them, yeah. I, I, not in the place of the parent, along with the parent. Um, I did that for Den Danita's ARD with, with Jonathan. And um, a lot of times that's a great resource for parents who are able to do that because um, bringing in a professional who knows the disability um, it, it puts you in a position of having um, more suggestions of mm -hmm. things that you can do. For us personally, when we go to our 504 meeting every year for my son, we bring in his play therapist who has always given wonderful, wonderful tidbits of advice to the teachers um, on you know, everything that she knows about, about my child, um, and how to bring success about for him. So it is very much a team approach, yes. absolutely a team approach. But I, I did want to touch a little bit on what do you do if you don't agree with uh, the, the end result of what the school says that they're going to give you. Mm -hmm. Um, it's important for parents to note that if, the ARD meeting is over and you have not come to a consensus with yes. the school, uh, you have the right to not sign. Mm -hmm. If you do sign, you are legally committing yourself to this IEP for your child. Um, and you will be legally bound until you have another ARD that changes it. So um, there is a process to where um, situations where parents and, and administrators or teachers don't come to an agreement where you would um, wait a couple of weeks and come back together again. And um, the basic thing I tell my clients is if it does not feel right to you, don't sign on the dotted line. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to come about to a to a decision. Now, let me ask you this. So what are the implications as a child goes on through the years uh, from elementary to middle to high school to college? Um, how does if they're diagnosed, let's say, with a special education need, um, how does that impact them as they go along uh, throughout the years as they progress? Well, it, it's very important for a parent to start thinking when their child is first diagnosed, whether that is at age four or six or 10 of a transition plan. Mm -hmm. What are you wanting, what are you expecting this child to accomplish um, as they transition from elementary to uh, middle school, from middle school to high school, from high school to work or college? Um, and those things change throughout the years, especially with, for kids with autism. We do not know when the kid is 10 what they're going to look like at 16, right. mm -hmm. especially as far as their independence. Um, but we should have some type of transition plan um, that guides their program. So, for example, if a child, if, if, um, if we know that our, 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 our some, most kids, the high-functioning kids with autism, they're... Um, academically they're able to learn and and sometimes is that one thing they may be stuck on science and you know mm -hmm. and they're able to go to college and do very well um so if if that's in our transition plan then each step of the way we're going to put things in place that will guide them. So all of the accommodations in middle school and high school will be keeping them in the general ed classroom and accessing the general ed curriculum. Um, but they're going to need way more accommodations than you know uh, uh, to help them. You know because they have sensory issues or you know the behavior which changes as they get older. Um, but our end goal is that we think that he can go to college. So. We're going to, you know, do uh, provide all of the services that will lead to that end. Um, so the, the main thing is to have the transition plan in place, um, which will change as the kid gets older. Mm -hmm. um, but And this is why we have uh, we have our meetings 
all the time it, every year everything will change the child's needs will change the behaviors will change right. and especially when you transition my son just transitioned this year into middle school mm -hmm. and so we had a new uh, 504 meeting with the new teachers the new professionals there at that school and it will happen again when he tra transitions to um, high school and one thing I didn't realize is that you can continue accommodations in college mm -hmm. right so when a kid graduates so IEP idea ends at 21 or when the kids graduates high school yes so after they graduate high school and they go on to college they it comes under a new law and that it be and if even if they have an IEP it becomes a 504 plan okay. which is governed by um, not idea but um, I'm at loss so, the so law yes, that so, governs that. So basically what, what Suzanne is saying is that, so one important thing to mention is that if a child is not at the point of being able to be graduating with the same knowledge um, that any other person in their class would be, say mm -hmm. they're learning life skills instead, they will receive services from the public school system till age 21, right. not till their graduating year senior year oh, so oh, they can go beyond okay. exactly High school. and yeah. oh. then yes and then when they go into college yes it does go under the 504 law but that is only for public colleges oh right. um, so not for yes. major universities uh, so public well it, it it would it be up to the university the okay yeah. because and then they only provide accommodations right yes Yes. They're not, not a change in curriculum, not a change, which would be special exactly. education. So At somebody, all. in order to come out of a university with a degree in something, You've got to do what you they have tell to, you do to do the exact thing. Exactly. <laughs> yes. wow. Right, and there's right. something to be said for that. I found out that it, if you have the special education um, label, that it can affect whether or not you get a regular degree from high school. Can you speak to that? Because there's a change in curriculum. You, just what you said, you're not learning all of the things that a typical child is learning. Right. So how does that work? So when a student gets to high school, um, there are different plans that a, a child can graduate with, uh, meaning the amount of credits, and, and the credits change the plan. So a kid who is uh, in a all special, so in high school you have the typical classroom with general education and then you have um, uh, classrooms that are just special education students so if a student is the the plan changes if a kid is just participating in special education program and not accessing on a full on a full scale the general education program mm -hmm. but all that means is that they can still go to college but they have to go to uh, a city college okay well, like a so, community, a community, yes, community, community college, college. Yeah. a rule yes. of thumb would be it's very individualized yes. basically if this student is learning at the rate where they feel like a typical child would be learning they can go on to a regular college if they are not then they would go on to a community college instead I could see that that would be a concern for parents as to whether or not they allow their child to have the special education mm -hmm. label and I know that that can be kind of scary for some parents so is this something that we need to be concerned about? Because, you know, they're, you know, you're like, I want my child to go to Harvard. <laughs> but I, is my I child able to, I, I mean, exactly. capable That's the of point. going yes. to Harvard? Absolutely. You know? It would yeah. not be a concern that I would have for my own children or for any client because it's pretty obvious whether you're looking at a person who is just trying to learn life skills in mm -hmm. general or whether you have a child who is actually learning academics. Right. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think that that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. yeah, and and I would, I would not advise parents to worry about it because, like I said, you know, our goals at age eight, um, it's it's hard to predict. Mm -hmm. At sixteen, you know, what what your child is going to be fully capable of. Um, you know, you you know your child and you. Uh, and you put everything in place to help them. But, you know, if they're capable of going to Harvard, um, having a special education label 
is not going to stop that because more than likely they will not need to be in an immersion of special education only classrooms. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 That's you know, true. I, I just I thought of that uh that show, The Good Doctor. Yes. 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 Uh-huh. yes. yes. I love that I, show. I, as, as a professional who works with people with autism, I'll say they do an amazing, amazing job depicting a high functioning. He's very high functioning. Um, individ- of course, there are a lot of parents who have lower functioning children and say, why don't we ever see them on TV? <laughs> but um, the way he reacts to situations is very, very on target as right. to how high functioning individuals so it. obviously yeah. his issues are more of a social aspect yes. and right the yeah. way he thinks about he zones in on one thing but you know he helps the world <laughs> yeah well guys gosh we could talk about this forever i think that we're going to have to have you guys back so that we can address some more of the <laughs> issues i have so yes yeah, yeah. Really did. so many more questions we really did. um what i do recommend for any parents that are listening is to go onto our website schooldazedshow.com and look in the resources section for the sample accommoda- uh, accommodations and modifications it has a list of all the things even down to arthritis that you can get <laughs> accommodations and services for in school and some of the possible accommodations that can be available to your child so you may think that you don't qualify for services but but you just mm-hmm. might so it's worth taking a look at and so uh, what we want to let you know is about um, some of the things that are going on with noggin before we leave the air today uh, we do have free tutoring in the DFW area. Wait, did you say free? I did say free. You <laughs> like that word free. Yeah, that's the like second free. time I that's said right. free. <laughs> so that's through Noggin Educational Foundation. And uh, please know that space is limited. And if you're interested in that, go to Noggin. And Noggin is spelled with two G's, N-O-G-G-I-N, foundation.org. And we would also love for you to donate to Noggin Educational Foundation. We provide free educational resources for students from low-income families. And we want to help as many students as possible in 2019 so please consider giving to our organization I did want to say one last thing I know there are a lot of parents out there um, that might be wondering what's going on with their kids and we did not get to go over everything Um, I would like to make myself available my email is rondi r-o-n-d-i at rondiallen.com it will also be on the website Danita's website for noggin Um, please contact me if you have any questions that we didn't get a chance to cover on the air all right. What's uh, going on with Noggin Educational Coaching, David? <laughs> so um, I'm, I've been cooking in the kitchen for quite some time, and uh, I'm about to pull the orders out. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so, But uh, I'm going to be launching a webinar for parents um, on some of the slips and uh, shifts that parents need to make in order to drive academic success from the home front as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'll give you more details about that next week. Uh, but also, uh, in the meantime, uh, please head to schooldaysshow.com for more information about the show and Noggin. That's schooldazedshow.com. And we uh, are honored to be here serving with you guys as well. So we always want to end the show by saying that we are parenting by grace. We Mm -hmm. depend on God to give us the wisdom and the strength we need to raise our kids into flourishing adults. And if you would like to know more about this, please feel free to email us at info at schooldazedshow.com. Have a great week.